Stewart. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on the rematch, uh, basketballnews.com, Fly TV. And I'm going to use a portion of this in my book. So I, I've, I've been following you. And I got to say, I've been really impressed by you for a lot of different reasons. So uh, I, I'm going to start off on the court. And then we're going to go away from the court. But I'm going to start off on the court. So you miss the entire 2019 season um, to an Achilles tear. Yep. And then you came back. And I got to say, first of all, you set the bar pretty high for like KD who's coming back and he's having a great season, but you set the bar pretty high. So you came back and um, you got the first team, all WNBA team, uh, second team, all WNBA defensive team. Y'all won a championship and the WNBA finals MVP. I mean, that's, that's setting the bar pretty high, but just take, take me through that whole process of battling back from an injury like an Achilles tear. Yeah. Um, you know, so when I ruptured my Achilles in spring of 2018, um, you know, similar reaction to as KD said, you know, he saw his career flash before his eyes. And that's mm -hmm. how I felt, you know, because it's like when you think of the Achilles, you think that's the worst injury to go through as an athlete, especially, you know, one where it's about athleticism and, and power and stuff like that. Um, so it was definitely a roller coaster of a journey for me. Um, was definitely happy to get on the court. And then, you know, right when I was cleared returning to play, we were hit with a, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so put a little wrinkle in things, but I was continuing to stay ready. And um, my expectations were high for when I came back into the WNBA season. Um, we started the season in uh, July, I think. I'm not uh -huh. sure exactly when we started, but you know, I had extra time to prepare and gave my leg extra time and, and really was able to kind of be my best. So when I came back, I felt, you know, I felt better than what, where I was before I left um, with the WNBA and just continuing to um, be my best. And, and yeah, the expectations are high for KD, but he's he seems to be killing it right now. So, you know, I have a lot of faith in him. And unfortunately, we see a lot of – athletes um having achilles injuries right now and i'm not sure why but i hope that they can all see you know the way we returned and and they continue to return even better i remember when um kobe um rest in peace when he, when he tore his achilles and he always talked about how it felt like somebody kicked him in the back of the leg mm -hmm. and he said he asked one so player i don't remember who it was he's like did you kick me and he was like no he said he knew right then that he tore his Achilles. Um, when when it happened, was that the type of experience that you had as well? Felt like somebody kicked you? Yeah. Um, so the only thing was I I ruptured mine when I was going into my jump shot. So when I was going up, it just went, which oh. is weird. Because usually it's when you step back. And I knew that there was a defender to the right of me. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in the air like, oh, she hit me. You know, because I fouled on play anyways. Right. Uh, and then I landed and I was like, something's not right. And I was like, I was on the ground and I was already thinking, like, I hope I broke my ankle. Like, because I don't want to rupture my Achilles, you right. know? Like, right. And then the moment I stood up, my, like, foot, like, went like this. Oh, wow. So it's like, I don't know. It's like, you can only feel the bottom of your heel. Wow. And then everything else is just limp. Wow. Wow. But you, you battled back, had a, an amazing season. Y'all won, you know what I mean? I think it was great. And then you won the Sports Illustrated uh, Sports Person of the Year. And you was one of um, five headlining honorees along with um, Naomi Osaka, uh, LeBron, um, Patrick Mahomes. And it, it was really a great, and I, I want to read this quote um, Sports Illustrated said about you. And I want you to react to the quote. Um, they said, when the moment came for Stewart to take a stand, the WNBA superstar didn't hesitate. Her support of Black Lives Matter never wavered from the season's opening tip to the Storm's title celebration. And so I want, I want to ask you, what caused your support for Black Lives Matter the way that you went full, like all the way in? You know, it's like sometimes people tiptoe in a little bit. You know what I mean? Like they they they're, they're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of things, yeah. but you went full all the way in. What what was the spark for that? 
Um, well, I mean, I don't think I'm not a toe dipper. That's that's definitely for sure. And I think that, you know, <clears throat> the fact that we were able to see all of the the social injustices happening um, this past year, and I think it's it was especially magnified because we were all at home mm -hmm. in those, you know, March, April, May months, and the power of social media and continuing to kind of see everything that was going on, whether it was um, with Breonna Taylor, um, or unfortunately all the other victims, Ahmaud Arbery. Um, and it was a no brainer to me. You know, I think that a lot was happening as far as, you know, how the league was going to play mm -hmm. and knowing that our league was, um, a league of 144 women and majority of those women are black mm -hmm. you know we knew that coming back we had to we had to be bigger than basketball and you know that that was at the forefront obviously i'm very happy that we won a, a championship mm -hmm. this this season but knowing that you know we had the the power and ability to continue to to uplift black lives matter continue to um call for for recognition for for brianna taylor and she still deserves justice mm -hmm. um from attorney general daniel cameron right. um and you know what we were able to do this season was extremely powerful but i think also the fact is that you know it's not this is not a one-off this isn't a one-time thing um yes a lot of things happened this season as far as the stance for black lives matter but they that should have happened years and years and years and years ago mm -hmm. um so we're we're a little late to the party but we're going to continue to um push for equality and fight for equality and especially like i said a league full of women we're always fighting for something right uh, so this was this was no different for us you know you mentioned brianna taylor and i want to i want to go a little bit more in depth with the the brianna taylor case and how yeah. that really struck a nerve for you, especially being a woman. And, you know, a lot of times when you're talking about police brutality, they don't talk about the cases with women as as much. You know, they don't talk about Sandra Bland. They don't talk about Shakisha Clemens, who was, um, you know, beaten at the Waffle House, you know, by one. And when you're looking at those cases, it, it, is, is, is it hard to ask yourself, would that have happened if they were white? You know, I mean that because I I I I have daughters and we we my daughter Imani um she she just turned thirteen so so we watch everything and she asks the questions all the time and she's watching and I you know had the honor of interviewing Chakisha Clemens and she watched the interview so we asked some questions about that but that question comes up a lot would this have happened if they were white so let's go to Breonna Taylor you know I mean would would that have happened if she was white. Uh, probably not. Um, obviously, I don't know, like exactly, but I would say no. I right. think that, you know, the fact is, like, like you were saying, that you know, we see everything happening about Black Lives Matter, um, but still, for some reason, Black women um, affected by police brutality are are kind of. Um, not in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. And that's why we were able to really, really, really um, promote Say Her Name this season. And when you were talking about Brianna Taylor, it just made me think of before the game, you know, every every game um, before this season in the bubble, mm -hmm. we were able to have kind of like um, a video montage of who we were recognizing that week, whether it was Brianna Taylor, whether it was um, Sandra Bland, whether it was Michelle Cuso, mm -hmm. um, and continue to educate ourselves and educate others because our country is not equal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's obvious. In a country that is supposed to be equal and everyone's treated the same, we're not. And you can see that by, I'm sure you saw the video of the the nine-year-old girl, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. black girl getting public sprayed in, in Rochester. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's I live in Syracuse. I'm from Syracuse, so right. Rochester's two hours away. Right. Uh, and to see that happen, and yeah, you you have to think: Would this have happened if she was a, a nine year old white girl? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Right, right. And you know, you mentioned you're from. You know, I went to Syracuse, and I I know so many people from Rochester, and I 
you know, I, I'm talking to some of them. My teammate Ryan Blackwell, he's he's from Rochester, and you know, I asked him what what's going, what's with, with the Rochester police? Like, how how is that? Like, how are they normally? And he said, honestly, the Rochester police is like every other police department in the country. You have incidents that happen, and you have you know things that you hear about and you experience. And if, depending on who you talk to, this is not something that is you know abnormal. And that's terrible to hear. You know, I mean, for for I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's like you hear each case, and it's like, okay, goodness gracious, this is like the worst case that I've seen. And then you see something that tops it, like the next week. But but for a nine year yeah. old girl, I mean, I'm my daughter's you know her age, and I'm looking. I'm like, first, why would you even have to handcuff a nine year old girl in the first place, and then to pepper right. spray her while she's calling out for her father? Like as as a father, that that hurt my heart to hear. But 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 then you're you're looking at you know society kind of make excuses for what they see happening from the police time and time again like like you don't have to be anti-police to say the police were wrong that's and that's what we're seeing yeah. right here and yeah. and and that's that's where the country always kind of gets caught up every time an incident like this happens yeah i i do agree i think that you know people get caught up in the in the other things you know they're like well you know the police like you said not all police are bad I'm like nobody's saying that. Right. Nobody's saying that. like right. look what happened in this instance, in this instance, in this one, in this right. one, in this one, and it's right. like something is not, um, something's not right. You know whether they're not being uh, educated correctly or taught correctly or uh, whatever the case may be. But there's no excuses, and you know there should be nothing looked at except what was seen and what mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. um, with with each case because there's no excuses. Like I said. I agree with you 100. You know, I read a I read a story about you. Um, that you were telling something that happened while you were in college. Um, you were you, you know you were driving. It was with a um, ex boyfriend who was who was black, and you were stopped by the police. Tell tell that story about what happened to you while you was in college. Yeah, so um, I was with uh, my now ex, and he was driving, and there was another uh, black guy in the back seat, and it was his teammate, mm -hmm. and we were on the New Jersey turn. Turnpike, and you know, like you know, you know, if you're in the the Northeast, everybody knows New Jersey Turnpike, New York City, back and forth. Um, and we got pulled over, and it was kind of like it was we weren't doing anything wrong. The officer asked for the two guys' license and not mine, and was like, "Is everything okay?" And I was like, "Yeah, like, what what do we do?" And he said that we followed the car too closely. Which is like impossible if you're in uh, the New York City area because right. <laughs> there's so many people and so many cars. Uh, and that was just an instance where it was like, no, the cop, he saw two black guys and a white girl and was like, I'm going to see what's going on here. So he asked you if everything, did he ask them if everything was okay? But was that just more directed to you? Like, was everything um, okay? I, don't, I just remember he was on my the passenger side when he came around uh -huh. and he asked me. He asked you. So it was kind of like, are you safe? Like, is everything yeah. okay? Are you here against your will? Like, yeah, what are, you, what are you talking about? And, and it's crazy because that's like a story like you, you expect to hear like from the 60s and traveling through Mississippi or something like that. But that was the New Jersey Turnpike, you know? Right. I mean, it, it's it's tough because you hear stories like that. And I, and I want to ask you, what did what did you come away from that situation thinking? Or what, what was your interpretation of it? And what did y'all talk about afterwards? I think we just we just talked about the fact that, you know, um, the police, the, that police officer was jumping to conclusions because of, you know, what the quick glimpse that he was able to see with mm -hmm. two black guys and a, and a white, white girl. And uh, it's something where it's like, you know, you go into the conversation where if you go into a, a a nice store and, you know, someone is following you around because maybe because you're black or, you know, because you don't look like you fit the description to be in that store. That was mm -hmm. like the similar case is like mm -hmm. um, people are, are prejudiced and, and judging you. And um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so as as a you know, and, and the thing about it is basketball and sports in general, 
has the ability to bring people together in a way that they may not have crossed paths otherwise. You know, yeah. I mean, and I, you're, you're exposed to other people's experiences and everything like that. Um, and, and I'm just curious as far as, you know, you're around black women a lot um, as far as, you know, from, from playing against them, playing with them, everything like that, around black women a lot. And in experiencing the privilege that you have of things that you can do that some of your black teammates can't do. Do you recognize it or is there some, because you're sometimes this is a um, touchy subject to bring up white privilege with a mm -hmm. lot of white people and they, it, they get offended and they're like, oh, wait a minute, are you saying that I grew up with money? They're like, no, it doesn't have anything to do with no, money. You, like, you, oh. you grew up and you're looked at differently. And you're looked at differently. Talk about that because a lot, a lot of people don't still don't understand right now we're, when we say white privilege, they immediately yeah. have certain things that come to their mind. Like talk about, yeah. you know, what you see, because you've spoken a lot specifically to white privilege um, for quite some time right now, you know, mm -hmm. but, but talk about white privilege and, and what that actually means to you. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, white, white privilege is just, you know, the fact that, that white people are seen, um, I guess differently with the same situations compared mm -hmm. to a black person. Okay. And, and, and that's how it is. White people are able to get away with more for whatever the reason may be. Um, like when I think of white privilege off the top of my head, you think of um, the Capitol riots, mm. you know, the domestic terrorist attack that, that really happened um, to our country. And, yes would the situation have been way different if it was however many thousand black people there mm -hmm. instead of white um and i think just realizing that and i think that the the special part about it is you know my opportunity to be able to to play basketball with and against people who come from all different races and backgrounds mm -hmm. is to be able to hear their experiences and learn from them and continue to uh, use that to, to educate myself and to educate uh, my circle and my friends and my family because yeah my family is white and one of my teammates from the storm you know her family's black and learning how things have affected her and and carrying that over to to my family if that makes sense no, definitely. Uh, and continuing to uh, put pressure on them and myself to to be better and to realize you know what's acceptable and what's not you know i i remember before the uh one of the you know games you you referenced how you all did the montages to um different people different women who have been victims of police brutality and things like that and i saw a beautiful one about sandra bland um and it just it's you know it hurts her all of these cases just hurt my heart so much even just saying the name like you get chills um but looking at the case and looking at the details of it and why the police officer was felt threatened, I guess, and in, in what they claimed, they felt threatened, was because she raised her voice, because she was yeah. fussing at the officer, and she was upset of the fact that she was pulled over and everything like that. And it's crazy because, again, I have to go back talking to my daughter, and she's like, you know, you know, kids are on the internet all the time. She's like, well, we see things of white people cussing out the police all the time and doing all this. And I'm like, right. yeah, but you got to understand, we can't do that. You know what I mean? Like we can't even think about doing that. Yeah, and it's terrible, and it's 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 sad for you. the fact that you even have to have those conversations with your daughter, saying that yeah, but they can and we can't, and right. that's I don't know. I think that you know, hopefully this year our country has has learned a, a lot about um, the people in it and the mm -hmm. people who are considered to be representing us. And I hope that we can continue to um, make this place better for, for people like your daughter, you know, mm -hmm. for people like her. And I hope that her experiences as she continues to grow up are, are different than, you know, the ones of, of my teammates. Right, right. And I, and I wanna ask you this, you know, cause it's been very, and to me, I think it's very important. The, the fact that you as a white person have have used your voice to speak to these things. Um, people hear it 
and, and it resonates throughout mainstream America differently when they hear you speak. And, you know, talking about white allies and why it's so important for white people in particular to speak out and call out racism and call out, you know, things that are unfair, even, even if they don't particularly, you know, are, are, are if they're not affected by it. The fact that they can say, um, you know, but it's wrong for anybody to be able to, to have to experience this. Talk about why it's so important to do that, because you've done that so great. And, and honestly, I think it's, it's an example for other white people to also use their positions of privilege and their positions to be able to speak about it as well. But talk about why it's important. I think it's, it's important because, first of all, it's, it's what needs to be done. I think that, you know, um, we've seen a lot as athletes, there is no, you know, sport and politics. Now it's super intertwined, you know, and we're people too. And we have the right to, to kind of speak on the things that we believe in. And I think that, you know, continuing to um, be vocal and be vocal as a, a white ally and continue to um, amplify the message for Black Lives Matter, for Say Her Name, for the Black community <clears throat> is what needs to be done. Because yes, as a white person, I have a different reach and a different platform than, you know, a Black person. And I think that, you know, that's why I continue to speak up because for, like for me, it's it seems super, super simple. Like, why mm -hmm. can't we all be treated equally? You know, and something so simple is really, really difficult to achieve for some reason mm -hmm. uh, and doing my best to to make sure that everybody is aware of, of what's going on in in our um, in our country and in our world and I think that you know also having the opportunity to uh, pass the mic you know mm -hmm. let um, people hear from you know the the black women in the WNBA and what they have done and the fight that they have been fighting for an extremely, extremely long time. And um, I mean, the WNBA, I'm super, super proud of what we've done. I mean, just even thinking about all the stuff that we've done that past season in the bubble and mm. we were supposed to play basketball and be our best. Right. <laughs> um, we, um, we did a lot, but I hope that we continue to, to kind of um, be on the right side of history and continue right. to push things forward in the right direction. You know, I, I see you wearing your um, the, the USA team uh, hoodie. And I, I remember a quote that you had because um, you was talking about the fact that you have been representing USA from 13, 14 years old. You know what I mean? Yep. In some capacity or the other, as far as the Olympic Games. And um, I want to read a quote from you. I wanted you to go a little bit more detail um, about this. You said, it's not easy. Uh, reconciling the way I feel about playing for Team USA, that pride, with the shame I feel about racism that contributes to my own privilege and the oppression of Black people. That's a strong quote. Um, yeah. And it's and it's just explain the dichotomy of having the, you know, the, the pride in your, your country and representing your country, yeah. but still seeing so much that needs to change in your country and the shame of you know oppression that happens in your country i it, it I, I thought it was very profound yeah i mean i think that you know when you think of the united states everyone thinks of the best you know we're we're the best and for me it was like you know when i think about i'm i'm on the podium i have usa across my chest we just won uh, we're watching the flag be raised and the anthem is going off. And that is like a tremendous amount of pride because it's mm -hmm. like we won for our country. Um, but then to, to be also representing everything else that's happening in our country, the racism that's going on, it's, it's sickening. And it's, it's, you know, something that obviously makes you, um what's the word i'm looking for um i guess just really you just can't believe it mm. and you know the fact that we can be on so many like such a different end of a spectrum mm -hmm. as far as 
you know, how you feel at that moment and what's happening in the world. And it's like, you know, I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of the racism that's going on in our in our country, the racial injustices that are happening in our country. And, um, you know, really taking it to heart and taking it personal and, and you know, realizing that, yeah, I'm, I'm a basketball player and I love to play basketball, but if I can help um, make our country and our world be a better place, then then that's what's most important. And I think you're you're definitely doing that. So I I guess just have to say I'm I'm so you know whenever we're talking about activism and the example of activism, the first example has to be the WNBA. <laughs> you know, yeah. and the, the way that you. But the most important thing is the way that you all do it all together collectively. Yeah. Like you know, no no other no other organization has moved everybody collectively the way that you all have and and this is not just this past season in the wobble but mm -hmm. going back before when the back back to back killings of alton sterling and philando castile happened and the way you all did y'all taught the men how to do a media blackout and yeah. use that time and you saw this past season in the bubble they followed your lead and it's it's important i, I just don't think that it's you're given the recognition enough for you know, the amount of it, it's etched in the history books of athlete activism, yeah. and I think that's really what the WNBA has has done. So I can't I can't say how much of a you know honor it is to to interview you and uh, honor it is to you know to to talk to you about this. And I, I just got to say, just want to encourage you to keep using your voice because it's really it's a powerful platform, a powerful voice, and that collective voice. Yeah. Um, of everybody together. I just think that's so incredible. So I want to ask you this. Um, how did you all do that? As, as far as, you know, you have players that aren't even from here, mm -hmm. that don't even know, you know, American politics, racial, you know, things that they, they come, they play the WMA, and then they go back to their country. But it's like you all educated them quickly and then they were all standing together and everyone as one unified voice and i just want to always ask how, how did y'all do that because 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 it wasn't football didn't do this when yeah. Kaepernick took a knee he was he was down out there by himself for yeah. a while and then eric reed was with them and then you know you have a player here a player there but for the most part you know what i mean but y'all did it all together and i want to ask you how did y'all do that yeah i mean i think like you said the wnba has uh been at the forefront forefront of social injustices um, for a long time now. And I think for us, it's, you know, obviously you have to educate those that maybe aren't in this country on what is going on. Um, but it's it's a no brainer for, for us. I think that, you know, we talk about it on our players calls or whatever the case may be, and we just do it. You know, we, we um, all, all put that same foot forward and and really take action to, to what we're trying to do. And I think you can see that with um, Revan Warnock, mm. you know, really representing him this this summer in the in the bubble um, and, you know, helping him get that um, that seat, you know, that state mm -hmm. Senate seat. Um, and <clears throat> it's just super encouraging. It's it's encouraging that, you know, we are in a league with so many strong powerful women mm -hmm. who come from different places different backgrounds different races and we can all come together as one and we know that you know we're strongest when we're together when we work all together i think that's great so much respect to y'all so all right last question basketball question um i want to ask you who are your favorite players to watch in the nba and the wnba just who who are your favorites who are the people who you would pay money to go see in both the yeah. NBA and the WNBA? Um, KD's my guy. I okay. mean, he's, he's definitely one that I'm going to see. Uh, what LeBron is doing okay. is kind of off the charts. So those two, I'm, excuse me, I'm definitely going to see. Okay. Um, and then in the WNBA, one I play with, Sue Bird. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Diana Taurasi. All right. And who else? Candace, I mean Candace. Candace is going to Chicago now, so that's I see. that's going to be crazy. I can't wait to can't wait to see it. Um, I know. I hope 
they don't play well against us. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Well, that's great. You know, so I, hey, I, I much luck to you. Uh, like I said, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, much respect to you and the entire WNBA. And thanks again for coming on the rematch and for, and for being a part of, of my book. So thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.